you mentioned sort of the uh, measuring local potentials with electrodes versus fMRI. Oh yeah. What are some interesting like uh, limitations, possibilities of fMRI? Maybe the way you explained it is like brilliant with with blood and it's detecting the um, the activations or the excitation because blood flows to that area. What's like the latency of that? Like what's the blood dynamics in the brain that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like how quickly can it? How quickly can the task change and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean it's very slow to the brain 50 milliseconds is like you know like it's an eternity uh let me maybe not 50 well you know maybe like uh you know let's say half a second 500 milliseconds just so much back and forth stuff happens in the brain in that time right so in fmri you can measure these magnetic field responses about six seconds after that burst of activity would take place all these things, it's like, is it a feature or is it a bug, right? So one of the interesting things that's been discovered about fMRI is it's not so tightly related to the spiking of the neurons. So we tend to think of the computation, so to speak, as being driven by spikes, meaning like there's just a burst of, it's either on or it's off, and the neuron's like going up or down. Um, but sometimes what you can have is these states where the neuron becomes a little bit more excitable or less excitable. And so fMRI is very sensitive to those changes in excitability. Actually, one of the fascinating things about fMRI is where does that, how is it we go from neural activity to, you know, essentially blood flow to oxygen, you know, all this stuff. It's such a long chain of, you know, going from neural activity to magnetic fields. And one of the theories that's out there is, you know, most of the cells in the brain are not neurons. They're actually these support cells called glial cells. And one big one is astrocytes. And they play this big role in regulating, you know, kind of being a middleman, so to speak, with the neurons. So if you, for instance, like one neuron's talking to another, you release a neurotransmitter, like let's say glutamate, and that gets another neuron, starts, talk, starts getting active after you release it in the gap between the two neurons mm -hmm. called the synapse. So what's interesting is if you leave that, you know, imagine you're just flooded with this like liquid in there, right? If you leave it in there too long, you just excite the other neuron too much and you can start to basically get seizure activity. You don't want this. So you got to suck it up. And so actually what happens is these astrocytes, one of their functions is to suck up the uh, um, glutamate from the synapse. And that is a massively, and then break it down and then feed it back into the neurons so that you can reuse it. But that cycling is actually very energy intensive. And what's interesting is, is at least according to one theory, and they need to work so quickly that they're working on metabolizing the glucose that comes in without using oxygen, uh, kind of like what, you know, anaerobic metabolism. So they're not using oxygen as fast as they are using glucose. So what we're really seeing in some ways may be in fMRI, not the neurons themselves being active, but rather the astrocytes, which are meeting the metabolic demands of the process of keeping the whole system going. It does seem to be that fMRI is a good way to study activation. So with these astrocytes, even though there's a latency, it's pretty reliably coupled to the activations. Oh, well, this gets me to the other part. About yeah. my, so now let's say, for instance, if I'm just kind of like, I'm talking to you, but I'm kind of paying attention to your cowboy hat, right? So mm -hmm. I'm looking off yeah. to the, or I'm thinking about the right, even if I'm not looking yeah. at it. What you'd see is, is that there would be this little elevation in activity in areas in the visual cortex, you know, which process vision around that point in space, mm -hmm. okay? So if then something happened, like, you know, all of a sudden a light flashed in that part of, of, you know, right in front of your cowboy hat, I would have a bigger response to it. But what you see in fMRI is even if I'm not, even if I don't see that flash of light, there's a lot of activity that I can measure mm -hmm. because you're kind of keeping it excitable and that in and of itself, even though I'm not seeing anything there that's particularly interesting, there's still this increase in activity. And so it's more sensitive with fMRI. So there, is that a feature or is it a bug? You know, some people, people who study spikes in neurons would say, well, that's terrible. We don't want that, you know. Uh, likewise, it's slow. And that's terrible for measuring things that are very fast. 
But one of the things that we found in our work was when we give people movies and when we give people stories to listen to, a lot of the action is in the very, very slow stuff. It's in, because if you're thinking about like a story, let's say you're you're listening to a podcast or something, you're listening to the Lex Friedman podcast, right? You're putting this stuff together and building this internal model over several seconds, which is basically, we filter that out when we look at electrical activity in the brain because we're interested in this millisecond scale. It's almost massive amounts of information, right? Um, so the way I see it is every technique gives you a little limited window into what's going on. fMRI has huge problems. You know, people lie down in the scanner. There's parts of the brain where you, I'll show you in some of these images where you'll see kind of gaping holes because there's, you can't keep the magnetic field stable in those spots. You'll see parts where it's like there's a vein and so it just produces big increases and decreases in signal or respiration that causes these changes. There's lots of artifacts and stuff like that, you know. Every technique has its limits. If if I'm lying down in an MRI scanner, I'm lying down. I'm not interacting with you in the same way that I would in the real world. But at the same time, I'm getting data that I might not be able to get otherwise. And so different techniques give you different kinds of advantages. 